Um, just keep your finger there open it there in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And just look at verse number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 5. The Bible says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So if you know what this is referring to, this is referring back to, obviously, the Old Testament times when uh, Israel uh, came, the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and, you know, the Lord had commanded them to enter into the promised land, the land of Canaan. And, of course, you might know the story that uh, um, Moses sent the two spies, you know, Caleb and Joshua, into the land. They spied out the land. Yes, there were enemies there. Yes, there were powerful uh, people, powerful uh, nations there. But they said, hey, you know, with the, with the Lord's hand, we can overthrow those nations. We can go in there. We can, we can defeat the Canaanites. We can take that land for ourselves. And, you know, what happened, you know, the, the generation of that time were fearful. They were afraid. They didn't, have the, they didn't have the faith that God would see them through to the promised land. So God then punishes them, doesn't he? He punishes them and they wander into the wilderness for 40 years. And the generation, the, 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 out of, the generation of the adults would pass away and the children that were 20 years and under would ultimately enter that promised land through the leading of Joshua. You know, so that's, the, that's what we're referring to here. And so the title for the sermon tonight is Age of Accountability, the Age of Accountability. And so, you know, it wasn't my design or, or you know, desire even to preach this sermon. It's just simply because there's been, uh, you know, comments made on social media, some questions that came away from people within this church as well about this topic. So I thought maybe it's a good idea to cover it, number one. That's one reason. That's not, not the only reason why I felt the need to cover it. But other two, the other two is because we're going through the Rightly Dividing series. We recently just covered the Old Testament, the New Testament, the old man and the new man. And I felt this tied in quite nicely with the teaching of the old man and the new man. And of course, we need that new man in order to be saved. We need to be born again in the spirit. And this ties in quite nicely with the idea of the age of accountability. Now, when I say the term, when I use the phrase age of accountability, let me just assure you one thing. It's not a phrase that's ever in the Bible. Okay. And, and when you have a phrase that's not in the Bible, it's open to interpretation. Now, I believe there is an age of accountability. And, and some of you guys might, have, might believe there's an age of accountability, but we might mean different things by that phrase. And the thing is, because we don't have that phrase in the Bible, you know, we're going to come at to different opinions of what that means. I do believe there's an age of accountability. And let me just say something before I start preaching this. You know, if we were to break down every doctrine we believe as brethren, you know, even if I just sat down with my wife, we broke down doctrines that we believe, we're going to find differences in doctrines, aren't we? I mean, there's no two people that, that's going to be exactly the same on certain things that they've come to believe. And just because you believe things differently to me, I don't think you're an idiot. I just honestly, I don't, I don't think anything like that. You know, what I, what I love to see is if someone holds a different position to me, what I love to see is that someone's able to defend it from the Word of God. You know, they're able to pull out the Scripture and say, hey, look, this is my study, this is what I've seen, this is what I've come to. Even if I believe it's incorrect, I appreciate the fact that someone can just open up the Word of God and show me why they believe that. Hey, that's, that's a good thing, you know. But then there's others that challenge you with the Bible, challenge you on doctrine, and you say, well, can you show me where that is in the Word of God? Well, I don't know where that is. Well, that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's hopeless. You know, that, that, that doesn't help anyone. It doesn't profit anyone. When you don't know what the Bible says, the reason you believe a certain doctrine is simply because you've heard it preached or you, you, know, you saw it on the internet or something like that and you've not done your own due diligence to study these things out. So the topic I want to cover, obviously, is the age of accountability. And so one thing that I, what I spoke about is, you know, there comes a time when we're looking at the old man and the new man, there comes a time when that, uh, when that spirit, you know, when you're born as a child, you're, you know, you're, you have a soul, you have a body, you have a spirit, there comes a time when that spirit dies and you need to be born again. Otherwise, when you die, you'll be lost in hell. You'll, you'll pay for your sins for all eternity into hell. And the idea comes up, well, you know, what is that age? Is there an age for these things? Now, let me start off what, with, with, with where this kind of begins because, you know, I believe very strongly that little children that pass away, you know, the little children that are too young to understand the gospel. Little children that are, you know, innocent in a, in a sense. You know, they might do wrong things, but they just, they do not understand the commands of God. They do not understand that they've offended the Lord God. I do believe these little children, you know, miscarriages, things like this, you know, abortions even, that these children go to heaven. And I'll just read a few passages to you. You don't need to turn there. I'll just, I'll just read some. So obviously we have the words of Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew 19, verse 14. Jesus said, suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such, of such, such what? The little children, of such is the kingdom of heaven. 
So one thing that's very clear in the Bible is that the kingdom of heaven is made up of the little children. Okay, little, and when the Bible talks about little children, it's talking about infants, minor ones. You know, often the word children can mean you know, different things. When, it says, when Jesus says little children, he's obviously talking about minors, you know, uh, young little children. He says, look, heaven is made up of those little children. There's many ways to prove this doctrine. I'll just read to you this one from 2 Samuel 12, 22. You guys know the story of King David where he committed adultery with Bathsheba. They had a child. And as the punishment for that adultery, God would take away that child that was born unto them. And then um, as that child is, you know, is, is, uh, you know um, condemned, I guess, by God in the flesh, you know, we see that David is fasting and, and he's depressed and he's sorrowful. But as soon as that child dies, you know, he, he, he lifts himself up and he's encouraged. And he says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, 22, and he said, speaking of David, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So we see that King David, a man after God's own heart, recognizes, well, you know what? I can't bring that, back child, that child back. That child will never come back to me on this earth. But one day I will be with that little child that was born and that died. And so we see there again, you know, uh, children going to heaven. And uh, just another sort of uh, a passage maybe you guys aren't even that familiar with, but Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 3, the Bible says, If a man beget a hundred children, wow, I've got a lot to catch up there. If a man beget a hundred children and live many years so that the days of his years be many and his soul be not filled with good, but also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. So he, you know, the preacher is saying, look, if a man lives a long life, has a bunch of children, but there's no goodness in his soul, you know, there's no burial for him, then it's better for this man. You know, I always assume this man is someone who basically lived a wicked life, a man who, who had, did not, you know, receive the right, imputed righteousness of Christ, you know, upon his soul, that this man, it'd be better for you to just have an untimely birth, you know, a miscarriage than to be this person. And so by, the re, by understanding the reverse there is obviously the miscarriage is better to be like that. Why? I mean, he just, the miscarriage dies, doesn't it? But it's better because the, that little child is with the Lord is there in heaven. So, you know, we have a few passages here of little children that go to heaven. It's not my purpose to go through uh, the whole list here, but this is where it starts with. We we all understand that there there comes a time where where, where little children, you know, who do not understand the laws of God, the commands of God, you know, uh, if they pass away, uh, they are with the Lord. And this gives us great comfort, great comfort. And then, you know, you you might take the next chapter of this. Well, you know, well, if little children are going to go with, be with the Lord, what is that age? Then there must be some type of cutoff point. There must be something where, you know, surely, you know, a man who's 40 years old, surely he's gone past that cutoff point. You know, a man that's 30 years old, surely he's gone past that cutoff point. Maybe 20 years old, and I'll have a look at this shortly, you know, 20 years old is, is one that gets brought up. Maybe that's the cutoff point. You know, there must be something that the Bible says, what is that point? What is that age by which someone um, is no longer, you know, uh, under the mercy of God, I suppose. Uh, he's died spiritually, and if he dies, he will go to hell. So what I want to cover very quickly, and look, it's not my goal tonight to cover every verse that people use to teach that the age of 20 is the age of accountability. There is that teaching that basically, if you're 20 years old, that is the age when you die spiritually. So on your 20th birthday, you die spiritually, and now if you are to die without the Lord Jesus Christ, you are destined to hell, okay? And... When I say that, that's not to confuse to say that that person cannot be saved prior to being 20, okay? That's not what uh, those that believe this teach, okay? But let's just understand where this teaching comes from. So please go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. I just want to focus on the core, doc- or the core uh, verses that are used to prop up this doctrine. I'm not going to cover every verse that's out there uh, t- that's used to prop it up. But Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. Genesis 2 16. Going back to Genesis, going back to Adam and Eve. And of course, we know the story of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God commanded them not to eat of. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Okay? So God says, don't eat of that tree. Which tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now go to Genesis chapter 3, please. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. So we we saw the command of God, 
And now we're going to see when Adam and Eve break that command of God. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, the devil of course, <clears throat> Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay, so these are the words of the devil, and he's actually right <laughs> with what he's saying here. And you'll soon see why. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took, uh, she took the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. So what do we see? They both, Adam and Eve, they both eat of the fruit that's on this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They eat of it, they disobey God, they, their eyes are opened, and they realize that they're naked. Okay? That, that there's come an awakening, some, some knowledge has come upon them. They realize they're naked, and they try to cover themselves uh, because of their nakedness. Drop down to verse number 22. Verse number 22, look at this. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. Well, remember how the devil said, hey, you'll be as gods? And so God recognized, yeah, well, he's become as one of us. In what way has he become like one of us? A greater understanding of knowledge, right? A greater awakening of knowledge. To know good and evil. That's how he's become as one of us. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So a pretty straightforward story there, right? So, you know, they, they've eaten from that tree. They're now, uh, they've been cursed by God. They've got that sinful nature. And God says, look, we cannot allow them to live forever. We cannot give them access to that tree of... Because if they literally could access that tree of life, they could live forever. But they'd be living forever in a fallen state, okay? We, we've corrupted sinful bodies. And that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to have new resurrected, glorified bodies which cannot sin. So that's why God had to prevent them from having access to that tree. Otherwise, you're going to have an earth full of people that live in long ages in corruptible bodies. I mean, how much sin, you know, how much destruction could man do if they had access to that tree? So that's the idea there, right? The tree, knowledge of good and evil. They've sinned against the Lord. They've been uh, taken out of the garden. So now go to the book of Deuteronomy, please. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 34. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 34. So the question is, we're, right, right, we're thinking about the age. Is there an age where God now holds you accountable uh, for your sins? In, you know, in other words, that you, if, you, if you were to die, you would go to hell. And Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 34. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 34. <clears throat> and the Lord heard the voice of your words and what, sorry, the context, the context. We started with the context, right? How Israel, the, the, the generation, would be too, were too afraid to enter into the land of Canaan, okay? And God is angry at the Israelites. And this is what the Lord says. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear, saying, Surely there shall be not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers, save Caleb the son of Jep Jepunah, uh, he shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he tr uh, have trodden upon, and to his children, because that they have wholly followed the Lord. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou shalt also not go in hither, but Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, this is now the key thing, moreover your little ones, who are the little ones, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, so the little ones and the children, which in that day, look at this, had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn you and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Now, I don't, I, did I have the passage there where it mentions the 20 years of age? I didn't have it there. I think I might have removed it. From, sorry, what was it? Oh, okay, okay. Well, anyway, it, it, uh, if, you, if you look at Numbers, what is it? Sorry again, brother? 14, 29. You know, God makes it clear that um, the age by which they would not be able to enter the promised land was over the age of 20. Okay, over the age of 20. But those that were under the age of 20 would be allowed to enter the promised land. And what we see here, I wanted to show you that verse 39, is that the, the reason God gives is because they did not have the knowledge, right, verse 39, the, the knowledge between good and evil. 
So they did not have the awareness, they did not have the same awakening that those that were adults would have. And so God, you know, has a greater mercy on these children, these that are under 20, and they would be allowed to enter into the promised land. So by putting these two things together, you can see where this idea of the age of accountability being 20 years old comes from. Number one, the, the knowledge of good and evil came upon those that were spiritually dead. We saw that in the book of Genesis, okay? And then number two, we see here in the book of Deuteronomy, those that do not know, uh, that don't have the knowledge of good and evil are seen as those that are under 20 years old. Okay, so you can see how this comes together and why some, and actually, let me just put it out there. I believe the age of 20 is the age of accountability, okay, but not in the same way that others do, okay. So we'll go through this uh, shortly. So why do I not believe then uh, that uh, the age of 20 is, you know, the uh, age where someone dies spiritually? Why, why is that? And why is it that actually, you know, something that seems quite straightforward, you know, you, you can see how people could put these passages together and come to that realization. You know, why is it that, you know, so many people don't hold to that position? Why is it that so many people don't believe that? And there are many, many reasons for that, okay? There are many reasons for that. And um, so I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to break this down. It, it's sort of difficult to sort of sometimes undo certain doctrines. I'm going to try to break it down as best as I can. But the first thing I want to deal with is the issue of the wilderness, this issue of the generation that have gone before that were going to now spend 40 years in the wilderness because they didn't have the faith to enter the, the promised land and those that were under 20 that they were allowed to enter the promised land. So let's start off with this idea, okay? They, the, the ones that were under 20 did not have the knowledge of good and evil. What does this actually mean? Okay, what does this actually mean? Does this mean they had not died spiritually and those over the age of 20 had died spiritually? That's the idea. That's the idea by putting those two passages together, okay? But let me, let me start off with this. Is God saying that literally, literally everyone over the age of 20, literally everyone of the Israelites that came out of Egypt, that they were unsaved, therefore they could not enter the land? Besides Moses and, and Caleb and Joshua. But everyone else that were of the Israelites, the other, you know, people think there might have been a million Israelites at this point in time, potentially. You know, could we say that everybody over the age of 20 were unsaved, besides those three people? That's you know, highly unlikely, okay, highly unlikely. So we, we can't take a literal position on that. We can't say literally they were not allowed because none of them were saved, except for those three over the age of 20. So that one doesn't fit, okay. Can we say, what about symbolically? We'd say symbolically this represents, you know, that's, that's where the idea comes from. Symbolically, this represents someone that is saved and unsaved. I'll cover that shortly, okay. But the third thing that kind of gets brought up when I've looked into this is, well, is this a type you know, is this a representation, a type of being saved? You know, going into the promised land, going into Canaan, is this representing salvation as a type? Okay, and this is why we read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So please go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Is this a type? We'll deal with symbolism later, but is this a type? It's definitely not literal. It's not literal, unless you think they were all definitely unsaved over the age of 20, and that's why God did not allow it. No, you know. Uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Now, when it comes to types, I've covered this in the men's leadership class. We've got to be careful. There's a lot of types in the Bible that the New Testament confirms. And those you can just stand on. You can just, you know, preach it. There are other types that you'll find that aren't confirmed for us in the New Testament. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. Okay. But when there's types that are clearly laid out in the New Testament, they're the, one, they're the better ones to be preached on. But 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, that's been the Red Sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So let's take type, typology here. Okay? When the Israelites came out of Egypt and they passed through the Red Sea, they had the, the, the waters around them, they had the cloud of God protecting them from above, the Bible tells us here, this was a type of baptism. The reason we get baptized, you no, know, the picture of baptism in the Old Testament was this crossing, crossing of the Red Sea. All right? So, obviously, do we get saved by being baptized? No. You know, we're saved prior to being baptized, of course, okay? And so, before they came to the Red Sea, they were in Egypt. And if you remember the night before they exited out of Egypt, what was, what was the requirement? What, what did God ask them to do? They were to keep the very first Passover, wasn't it? They had to take the lamb, shed the blood, put it on the doorposts, 
And the Bible tells us that lamb, that's a type of Jesus Christ. That's a type of the shed blood of Christ. That is the type of our salvation. Okay. So if we're following this journey of, a ty of typology of the journey of Israel, you know, we would start off when they exited Egypt because of the Passover lamb. That's a type or a picture of salvation. When they got to the Red Sea and they went through the Red Sea, that's a picture of baptism. Okay. Now, when we get to the, uh, you know, the, 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 the initial point where God required them to answer the promised land, can we go back now as a type and say this is about salvation again? No, we can't. Okay? We can't do that. What it represents, we'll have a look at it again. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Okay? The ones that didn't want to go into the land of Canaan. Verse number 6. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of this destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for and samples that they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now, what is the picture of the 40 years in the wilderness then? What is that sort of representing? Well, this has been written to the Corinthian church. It's been written to believers, right? And, and what it's saying here when it started off there with the baptism, going through the Red Sea, and then going through the wilderness, what is that a type of? Well, that's our spiritual walk, right? When we're, we're, we're trying, you know, we got and saved, we've been baptized, we're trying to walk after the ways of the Lord. But when you fail, you know, when you're a miserable Christian, when you sin, when you go against the Lord, this is the picture of the wilderness, you know, the 40 years. And this is why many, you find many preachers, when they preach about the land of Canaan, they don't preach about it in context of salvation, they preach about it in context of spiritual victory. You know, they've entered into the land. They now have the faith. You know, because faith is not just salvation. We live by faith. We walk by faith. They now have that faith to enter the land and, and win many spiritual battles. And so if we were to take that as a type for us today, that would be when we're succeeding as a Christian, when we're having victories as a Christian, when we're defeating, you know, uh, false doctrines, when we're seeing people come to the gospel. This would be a picture of us in the promised land, in the land of Canaan, because we're having great spiritual victories in our life. And therefore, the wilderness represents when we're backslidden, you know, when we're failing, when we're sinful, those kinds of things. So you see how as a type, this doesn't actually pick, uh, fit the, the picture of Israel's journey from the land of Egypt to the land of Canaan. All right. Now, I'm going to get to symbolism a little bit later, but let's just keep going. Let's keep going. Because uh, the next thing that gets brought up, I guess, I mean, I'm just trying to think this logically. Okay. And if I'm, if I'm missing a point and you guys want to ask me later on, please ask me because... You know, I'm doing the best I can. But just thinking logically for myself, the next thing is, you know, we would think, you know, just, just as parents, you know, as adults and, you know, we've had children and these kinds of things, people say, well, how can you say that those that are under 20 have no knowledge of good and evil, right? You say, well, surely like a 19-year-old knows that murder is wrong. You know, surely an 18-year-old person knows that theft is wrong. Surely a 12-year-old boy or girl knows that lying is wrong. Surely they know the difference between that which is beneficial and that which is harmful, that which is good and that which is evil. And so, yes, you know, you can appeal to logic there. You can appeal to common sense. But here's the thing. You know, we need to make sure we build our, our understanding on the Word of God. Okay, we need to make sure we do that rather than just our feelings. Now, it's true. From a man's perspective, it makes it's common sense that children under the age of 20 know the difference between right and wrong, the difference between good and evil. But the argument is, is not, well, what does man think? What, well, from man's position, what about God's position? You know, maybe from God's perspective, he believes that those that are under 20 do not know the difference between good and evil. Okay? And that, that's where this kind of you know, builds on, because we saw that God had that point of 20 years old when they entered into the land of Canaan. So what I want you to do is please go to 2 Kings chapter 22, please. 2 Kings chapter 22. We're dealing now with the topic, does God see those that are under 20? Does, from God's perspective, are they people that know the difference between good and evil? Are they people that have that knowledge between good and evil under the age of 20? Because if they do, then they would have already got into a point where they've 
got the knowledge of that. And, you know, that they, are, that they now are spiritually dead, in a, in a sense, if you take that view of it, okay? But 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 1, the Bible says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jedediah, the daughter of Adariah of Boshkath, and he did that which was right in the sight of men, no, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. So we see that King Josiah is a very godly king. Even from the age of eight years old when he began to reign, he was doing that which was right in the sight of God. You know, and I would just say he did that which was good. He did that which was good. He had the knowledge of what was right. He had the knowledge of what was good at the age of years, eight, eight years old, which is why he was able to do these things all the days of his life. You know? And he, he reigned for a, a long time. It's a great privilege that God gave him. Now go to 2 Kings 24, please. 2 Kings 24. 2 Kings 24. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from 2 Chronicles 36, verse 9. Just pay attention to, to what I'm going to read now. 2 Chronicles 36, verse 9. We're going to look at another king now. This is King Jehoiakim. Okay? King Jehoiakim. It says here, Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign. He was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. So he didn't reign very long at all. You know, just over three months. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did that which was evil in the in the sight of the Lord. So from God's perspective, were these kings doing what was good and which was, which was evil? Yeah. You know, from God's perspective, they already, even at eight years old, both these kings knew what was good, knew what was evil. Okay. Now, just to make sure that, you know, um, you guys see this very clearly, you're in 2 Kings chapter 24. 2 Kings chapter 24 verse 8. This is where some, you know, I don't, I don't want to be, you know, told that I'm, I'm not being thorough with this, but some people say that Jehoiakim, what I just read here, um, that there's a contradiction in the Bible. Because I just read to you that he reigned when he was eight years old, right? But look at 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 8. It says here, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign. So is there a contradiction in the Bible? Because in 2 Kings it said he was eight. But here in, in oh, sorry, in 2 Chronicles it said he was eight. In 2 Kings it says he's 18. Is there a contradiction? Well, there's, no, there's never a contradiction in the Bible, okay? Never a contradiction. Basically what happened was when he was eight years old, his father, you know, was training him, basically training him to be a king. And so they reigned together as father and son since the time that he was eight years old. But then when we get to 2 Kings, it records exactly the point when his father passed away. And then at the age of 18, now he was ruling Israel on his own. Okay? But again, he's 18, he's under the age of 20. Okay? Um, if this doctrine is true of the age of accountability, it would, say, it would mean that at, at 18, he wouldn't know the difference between good and evil either. Okay, so even though he's 10 years older, he wouldn't have that knowledge. But it says here, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. So there's the three months that he reigned, right? And his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. So see, at the age of 18, he only, look, we can't say, well, maybe he did evil later in his life. He only ruled for three months. So by the end of his rule, he was still under the age of 20. And according to the sight of the Lord, as far as God's perspective came from, he did that which was evil. Okay? He did that which was wrong. He followed after his father's footsteps, unfortunately. Okay? So I don't, I don't believe we can remain consistent in the Bible to take the view, well, from God's perspective, you know, under the age of 20, they don't know the difference between good and evil when we see these kings were ruling. And from God's perspective, they were doing that which was uh, good or evil. So I don't believe it's consistent with the rest of the Bible. Now, you go to 2 Samuel chapter 19, please. 2 Samuel chapter 19. Because I want to view this, look at this from various angles, okay? Various angles. 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 31. And I apologize that the sermon's a little bit long tonight, but I do want to try to be thorough with this. 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 31. And look, the reason I'm thorough is because I love you guys. That's why. You know, the reason I spend time, I don't, like I said, I didn't really want to cover this. The reason I cover this, the reason I cover some things that I preach is because I, I love this church. You know, I want to make sure that we're as right on doctrine as possible. I know none of us are going to be 100% correct on everything. I know in the back of my head, there are doctrines that are probably heresies right now. In the back of my head, some way compartmentalized back there, things that I'm still trying to work out versus that I'm still trying to decipher. You know, maybe I've got it 60% nailed down, but there's 40% of doubt. We're, we're all like that. 
You know, we're all like that. Again, if we just uploaded our, our brains with doctrines and put it all out there, you know, I'm sure we'll be ashamed of some of the things that's, that's there because we're always just constantly learning. We can't, you know, uh, how, you know uh, there's, 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 I'd be ashamed of if you guys thought you were so proud you had every doctrine knocked down perfectly. You know? And so we need to break these things down. We need to see what the scripture says. And look at 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 31. Because again, I want to deal with this thing we've been 20 years of age and having the knowledge of good and evil. But in 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 31, we have the story of this man, uh, Barzillai, Bar- Barzillai. And he's a friend to King David. Now, this man makes an appearance with King David in the story of Absalom. When Absalom tried to take over, well, he did. He briefly took over the king of David. And, and this king... Uh, uh, sorry, this uh, friend, uh, Barzillai, became a friend to David and provided many needs for him while he was, um, you know, um, escaping from the hands of his son. But in 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 31, says, uh, And Barzillai, the Gilead, Gileadite, came down from Rogalim and went over Jordan with the king to conduct him over Jordan. So now that King David had victory, his friend brings him over to uh, uh, the Jordan River and, and just, just escorts him basically back into his kingdom back there. And then verse 32, now Barzillai was a very aged man, even four score years old. How old was he then? He's four score. He's 80 years old, right? 80 years old. And he provided the king of substance while he lay at Mahanaim, for he was a very great man. And the king said unto Barzillai, come thou over with me, and I will feed thee with, with me in Jerusalem. He goes, look, come to Jerusalem with me. I'll take care of you. you know? And this is what he says to, to King David, verse 34. And Barzillai said unto the king, How long have I to live that I should go up with the king unto Jerusalem? I am this day fourscore years old, and can I discern between good and evil? He says, look, I'm 80 years old. I can't even discern now between what's good and evil. You know, he says, look, I've gotten to an age, I've gotten older, I can't even tell, you know, my, my senses aren't even that as it used to be when I was younger. You know, he says, look, I can't even discern now between good and evil. This is what happens when you get older. As you get older, you know, you start to become a bit senile, you start losing a bit of knowledge, you, you, you know, you don't have the same kind of awareness and knowledge that you once used to have because, you know, your body's starting to break down. And he's, he says his mind, you know, he can't, he's unable to discern, let's keep going, can thy servant t- uh, taste what I eat or what I drink? He says, look, my taste buds aren't like they used to be. You know, what's the point of eating, you know, the great food from the king's table? I can't even taste it, you know. And uh, then he says, can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? He's like, I'm going deaf, right? I'm getting old, I'm going to death. Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto my lord the king? Okay, now this, doesn't, this is not a conclusive thing. I, I'm just trying to show you where a man who's 80 years old, you know, he's 80 years old and he says, look, I, I can't even discern anymore between that which is good and evil. But, you know, if, if the 20-year-old point was the point where you would discern between good and evil, then we would say he, he had a knowledge at some point, and now he's losing that knowledge at some point. So is this, is this tied in with losing your soul, do you think? Do you think this is tied in with being spiritually dead? Or is the knowledge of good and evil more tied in with a greater awareness, a greater understanding of certain things of, of life? I just want you to think about that, okay? Now go, now go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. And uh, we're going to the passage here where, you know, uh, Paul the Apostle, I believe it's Paul, he's writing the book of Hebrews, and he's criticizing the Jews, he's criticizing the Hebrews. You know, he's saying, hey, you should be teachers by now. You should have matured in the Lord. You should have grown, okay? And he calls them out for the babes they are. But in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says, for when, for, sorry, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers... Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So look, you ought to be teachers by now. How old do you think these people are? I would say they're definitely over the age of 20. Like if they're going to be people that are teaching in the church, okay? They, we're, we're dealing with people that are older. He says, look, you should be teachers by now. Verse number 13, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. He says, look, you're unskillful because you're a babe in Christ. You've not grown. You're still that little baby. You're still that little child. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. To discern both good and evil. Who's he speaking about? He's speaking about believers, right? Believers. And he says, look, you cannot discern 
between what's good and evil. I can't even give you, right? I can't give you, you need the strong meat. That's how, if you get the strong meat of the Bible, that's how you're going to be able to discern what is good and evil. He says, look, your babes, you're still in the milk. I've got to feed you the milk again. So what's he saying about them? That they haven't got the knowledge of good and evil. They can't, I mean, discerning, basically, to discern something is to have the knowledge, right? To have that knowledge and be able to tell the difference between that which is good and that which is evil. Is this tied in with salvation? No, these people are already saved. But what is this tied in? Someone that is saved but hasn't got a great knowledge. They haven't, become, you know, they haven't grown in knowledge of certain truths in the Bible, especially the strong meat. Okay? I'm trying to show you points, other points in the Bible that reference good and evil of knowledge and things like this and how it does not tie in with the age of 20. I would say these people are beyond the age of 20 and Paul is still saying you can't even discern good and evil yet. You, know, you can't even eat the strong meat just yet okay so that deals with that age issue there with the age of 20 years old now let's go to exodus chapter 30 please exodus chapter 30 exodus chapter 30 exodus chapter 30 verse 11 well actually let's not start with verse 11 let's start off with verse 14 and then we'll go back to verse 11 verse 14 exodus 30 verse 14 Let's read this. It says, everyone that passeth among them, let me give you context. Again, Israel, Moses, you know, they're here, they're, 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 they've been instructed by God to build the tabernacle, you know, to build, to, you know, the, the, the priesthood, how animals ought to be sacrificed, all these things that God says needs to be done in order for the tabernacle to, to be put into place. And now he's asking for people basically to pay a tax, to pay a tax to, to you know, to, to pay for the equipment, to pay for the workers, all these things. And so we get here in verse number 14, everyone that passeth among them that are numbered, look at this, from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. Now, what kind of offering? More often than not in the Bible, the offering is a sacrifice of an animal. Okay, but this time it's not an offering of an animal, it's an offering of money. Okay, it says here, um, an offering of the Lord, verse 15, the rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. So they had to give half a shekel, each one of them. When they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls, and thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. Okay. So this sounds, yeah, you know, if you took the position where people were saved in the Old Testament by sacrificing unto the temple, yeah, or, or even potentially here, you know, they were saved because they gave half a shekel for salvation. This is, you know, this sounds quite strong. Hey, they're given this half shekel to make atonement for their souls. Because in the New Testament, when we, well, I think it's only mentioned once, but it speaks of Jesus Christ being our atonement, okay, where he has satisfied the need for us so we can be saved. You know, satisfied at all by his death, burial, and resurrection. He's paid for all of our sins. And so when we take that view of Jesus Christ being our atonement for, for our souls, let's put it that way, you know, not going to hellfire, when we go back to the Old Testament here, and it speaks about this half shekel being atonement for the Israelites, we can see how that ties in. And when we're talking about dealing with the age of accountability here, it says only those that are 20 years old and over should be given this uh, shekel. Okay, so it sounds pretty strong there. It sounds pretty strong that, hey, everyone that's over the age of 20 needs to give an atonement for their souls. Now, just very quickly, you know, I've already covered this, but, you know, and, and you know, I'm not saying that those that believe this believe what I'm just about to say, but we already made the point that, you know, you could not be saved under the Old Testament practices. You could not be saved by keeping the Old Testament laws. You could not be saved by doing the Old Testament ceremonies. You could not be saved by keeping the... You could not be saved by anything based on the Ten Commandments uh, of the Old Covenant because salvation, again, has always been by grace through faith. These things are always a picture, a type, a symbolic representation of what Jesus Christ was. So the view is here, well, what is this symbolic of? Surely this, this demonstrates here that perhaps this half shekel here is a symbolic gesture toward atoning our souls, and only those that are over 20 truly need the atonement of souls. You, you can see where I'm going here, okay? Now, there's a few things that I, I want to deal with here. When we're dealing with the word soul in the Bible, yes, many times it is about the internal soul of man, which is, you know, needs to be saved, which is cast into hell if it is lost. More often than not, I mean, just do a word study for the, the you know, I mean, 
It, it, the vast majority of verses, if you just did a word study for the word soul, it is not about that part of, the, of, of man. It's just about life. It's just a human being. Many times, the Bible says that eight souls were saved by water when it comes to the reference of the ark, of you know, uh, Noah's ark. And so many times, just, just a living person, just walking the earth, they're often referred to as a soul, okay? So I'm not saying that's necessarily what it's about. I'm just saying that many times that's what the Bible refers to. So we need to be very careful about how we apply certain things, especially with that word soul. But the th next thing that I want you to understand is this isn't saying, well, I, this is kind of hard to prove, but I'll try my best to prove it. This isn't saying that everybody over the age of 20 had to give half a shekel. It sounds that way. It sounds that way. Let's back up to verse number 11, Exodus chapter 30, verse 11. Exodus chapter 30, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give, look at the next words, every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord when thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. This they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary, a shekel is twenty uh, jiras, a half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Now one thing I want you to point your attention to, and this is what I believe very strongly, and it's a bit hard to prove, but if we look at the pattern that we see in the book of Exodus, you'll soon see why I believe this. But when it says that every man will give this ransom, this half shekel, I believe this was literally every man. Every man that was over the age of 20. So it wasn't just those that were under the age of 20 that did not give half a shekel, but no women gave uh, the half shekel either. It was just the men. Okay? And th this is often, you'll see this pattern in the Bible where the patriarch, the, 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 the head of his family, would do these things on behalf of his whole family. On behalf of his whole family. And I want to show you this pattern because here's the thing. When you do a study for the word every man, you know, the Bible uses sometimes every man for every single person that ever lives, man, woman, and child. You know, when, 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 when God uh, brought the floods upon the earth and destroyed, the Bible says that every man perished. You know, but of course, that's referring to women, children as well of every man. But many times the Bible, when it just talks about every man, it literally just means the men, the men that are over here at the age of 20. And so what I'm trying to say to you is the ones that were given half a shekel was the head of his house. You know, his, his, you know the half shekel that he gave covered his wife, covered his daughters, and covered his sons that were under the age of 20. But any of his sons that were over the age of 20, I, I suppose God expects them to be working, to have that half shekel. You know, now they're accountable for themselves. I do believe in an age of accountability at the age of 20, where they then had to then give of their own half shekel as well. Now let's look at this pattern in the book of Exodus. Let's start off with Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. And I, I've covered this again in the men's leadership class. When we're trying to build context of a verse, I strongly encourage stay within the chapter if you can. If you can find the answer within the chapter. If you can't, stay within the book, the book that it's written. If you can't, stay within the same writer of the books. You know? And if you can't, yeah, of course, go through the whole Bible. Yeah, and nothing wrong with using the whole Bible for context. Okay? But it's best to try to keep it as narrow as you can. So I want to try to keep it here with the book of Exodus. Let's have a look at this. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. These, and this is talking about the, when, when Jacob, uh, Israel, went into Egypt with his sons right, at the end of the book of Genesis. But Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Look at this. Every man and his household came with Jacob. So every man and his household okay, came. And then here, I won't read them all, but we go verse number 2, 3, 4, all different uh, names of the men of the tribes of Israel. And then in verse number 50, it says, look at this, and it uses the word souls here, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. Okay. So I was basically saying, look, there were 70 uh, of Jacob's uh, descendants that went into the land of Egypt, but only 12 uh, or, or every man being his sons and then his son's household under that. So you can see how every man here is not just referring to the man, but then also his family that is under him. Okay? Look at Exodus chapter 11 now. Exodus chapter 11, verse 2. Exodus chapter 11, verse 2. Just trying to keep it within the context of the same book. Exodus chapter 11, verse 2. The Bible says here, I just want you to, I want you to see the, show you how the Bible sometimes uses the differences here. Speak now in the ears of the people. And let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. 
Uh, the reason I just wanted to show you that one is just to show you how, yes, the Bible does sometimes use every man when it's just speaking about men. Because here we see the difference of every woman. Okay. Now go to Exodus 12, verse 3. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. And now we're going to the Passover lamb. Okay, the Passover lamb. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. The Bible says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them, look at this, every man a lamb. Now, do you think every person, every Israelite, took a lamb for the Passover? What do you think when it says every man took a lamb? It's basically the head of the house. It's the patriarch of the family. You'll soon see this. Every man a lamb. Look at this. According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Okay? So every man was responsible for doing this on behalf of his family. Verse number four. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the, of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So just a few things there. Just seeing the every man and every when, when men were called to do this, they would do it on behalf of their families and also just the use of the word soul. You know, the word soul many times just referring to just someone that's alive, that's living, just a, just a person, uh, a soul under the house of that man. Let's go to Exodus 16 now. Exodus 16 verse 15. Exodus 16 verse 15. We're fast forwarding now to when Israel are, in the, uh, are going through the wilderness and they ask God for food and God sends them manna. Remember the manna from heaven, the bread from heaven. And then in Exodus 16 verse 15, it says here, And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Look at this. Gather of it every man according to his eating. Now look at this. Did everyone go out and collect manna? Let's have think about it. Every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. So when it came to the manna, every man was commanded to go and collect the manna. Makes sense. We should be providers for our families, men. You know, and they were to sort of look at their persons, look at the people that are within their tents, their families, their servants, and go and gather that for on behalf of his family, basically. Okay? So I want, I want, I'm trying to show you the pattern that takes place here. That every time the Lord is commanding every man to do these things, it's the patriarch of the family that's doing it. Okay? And then obviously, uh, so we see, we, see the, we see that pattern there. And I hope that kind of shows you then when we get to the pattern where every man had to give that half shekel that yes, he, every man did it for his whole family. You know, that, the same practices that we see through the pattern there in the book of Exodus. So if this was symbolic, if this was symbolic of salvation, then if, if I'm right in this, I'm, I believe I'm right on this, this would mean that only men over the age of 20 need to be saved. You know, we can't say everybody under the age of 20, it would be then every woman, under, you know, every woman wouldn't need to be saved either because they didn't have to give that half shekel for the atonement of the souls. It was just that man that was over the age of 20 or the man that was the head of his family. So you see how the, I wanted to cover the symbolism. So the symbolism breaks down as well, okay, with that uh, teaching. So I hope you can see that pattern as you read for the book of Exodus. These things are not, you know, these things require you to read through your Bible multiple times, you know, to see the patterns and see how things develop, you know. And uh, so I, I don't expect sort of the, you know, if you've only read your Bible through once or you haven't even read it from cover to cover, I don't expect you necessarily to see these patterns. It's not till you read them, you know, over and over again uh, that you start seeing these things. Now, here's my other issue that I have with symbolism here, okay? The other issue, referring to the age of 20 being the age where someone, you know, needs to be saved after that age because they're lost, is this isn't the only thing that might represent salvation. One thing that is a sure thing that represents salvation is circumcision. And I'm not even going to read the passage that I have this, but you guys know that when the Lord commanded, you know, uh, Abraham to, to, be, to circumcise his household, they were to, be ha to circumcise at what age? Eight days old, eight days old. And the, the circumcision was only for men. It, you, women cannot be circumcised, okay? And they were eight days old. And that was definitely a type or a picture of salvation, of the circumcision of the heart. So if we take symbolism too far, we could say, well, the age of accountability is eight days old. You know, if we were to, to keep a consistent view of how we take the symbolism and the ages that we see in the Bible, and you see how symbolism falls short. 
This is why we need to be careful when we read our Bibles, when we come to doctrine, we build our doctrine on things that are clearly spelt out, clearly spelt out. You know, um, just be, be mindful. There's a lot of things that are true in the Bible. There are a lot of things that I want to preach, but I hold back from preaching because I just don't know. I, I, don't, I, can't, I can't say for certain this is 100% sure, so I'd rather not preach on that, you know, and in case it's wrong and then, you know, uh, influence others to believe incorrectly as me. Now, the question is, when do we die spiritually? Let's go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. We're, we're nearing the end now. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Romans 7, 7. Because this is the main chapter, and of course, you guys already probably know it very well. This is the main chapter that deals with spiritual death. Okay? And I believe this ties in perfectly with the book of Genesis. And we will go back to Genesis. We will go back to Adam and Eve and the knowledge of good and evil. Don't worry about that. We'll, we'll look at that soon. But Romans chapter 7, verse 7 says this. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I, have not, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Okay? But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. This is concupiscence in a way of saying lust. For without the law, sin was dead. So for what I gather here from the Apostle Paul, when he realized he was a sinner, it's when he realized that he was lusting, he had a problem with covetousness, he had a problem with lust, okay, whatever that, was, that lust was in regards to, that's when he realized that he was dead, okay. Look at verse number nine. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death, for sin taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me okay so a, a few things here a few things here we see that the apostle paul with lust and i, I don't believe this was lust for the opposite sex because this this was a man that was uh, basically a uh, uh what do you call him ah, eunuch eunuch all right so he was probably lust other things maybe power maybe maybe a position you know he was he was training to be you know a pharisee of high status maybe that was lust and those kinds of things he re, that was the sin that caused him to realize, man, I'm a sin on the side of God. So, something happened to him at some point when he realized that he died. He died spiritually, okay? Now, I'm, I'm not saying this is for all of us. I'm not saying that all of us get to the point where we lust about whatever it is, and that's when we die spiritually. And I think the Apostle Paul uses this vague language. Look at verse number eight. But sin taken occasion by the commandment. What commandment? The commandment, okay? Now, we know the commandment he's talking about for him is the commandment that shall not covet. Okay, but you see, it's kind of used in a, in a general sense. Look at verse number nine. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came. What commandment? There's so many commandments in the Bible. I think it's kept vague for us because when we get to a point, when we understand we've broken one of God's commandments, whatever commandment that is in your life that you get to, that's when you die spiritually. That's when you die spiritually. And uh, that's when you need to be saved and born again 100% because you've gone past that age of accountability. I wouldn't say it's an age, right? It's something that is knowledgeable, something that you gain at some period of time in your life. You know, it's not, it's not an age. It's not a birthday and now I am now dead spiritually. It's some type of awakening, some type of awareness when you realize I've broken the commandment, whatever commandment that is. I've broken the commandment of God. I'm a sinner in the sight of God. Okay. Now, what I want to do is go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden here. And I really want to break this down because I think this is going to help um, clarify you know, any confusion here. Um, I wanted to leave this last. And um, you see, one thing you learn, and you need to, you need to have patience with this, all right? When, when, when brethren have different, different views, all right, um, what happens is, you know, I've got all my verses for my view. My brethren has, you know, his verses for his view. And, you know, my, my brother's chatting all the verses, blah, 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 you know. And I'm like, yeah, I believe all that. And then I'm like, but blah, blah, blah. And my brother's like, yeah, I believe all that. <laughs> all right. So what, 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 what requires effort, what requires patience and love is doing the study and going back. Where, where did this originally come from? Like, we've got these different views. You know, can we trace it back? Can we go all the way back as to where that issue was, that first little crack? You know, let's say the Son of God, you know, uh, Isaiah 9, 6, you know, and... Um, and he shall be called um, the everlasting father. Oh, he's the God, the father. Just that little crack. And now when you, when you start taking other positions and other things and you start looking, man, it becomes this massive chasm in doctrine, doesn't it? 
And so you often need to trace it back. Where was that issue? Where was that one thing that caused that divide? And I believe we can find the answer here in Genesis chapter 3. And again, they remember they had eaten from the book of life. And let's look at this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Why, let me think about this. Why did Adam and Eve die spiritually? Was it because they had the knowledge of good and evil? Is that why they died? Let's have a look. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. When Adam's defending himself, he says this. And unto Adam, he said, God said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee. What was the commandment that slew Adam of eating of the tree? Okay, this is, this is really important when it comes to this, because let's understand this. Did Adam knowingly break God's law prior to having the knowledge of good and evil? Let's say, the knowledge, let, let's say this area here is knowledge of good and evil. Okay? He's got this awakening, he's got this awareness of knowledge, greater knowledge than he had before. But did he sin when he had the knowledge of good and evil? Is this when he became a sinner? Or did he sin, did he break God's commandment prior to having the knowledge of good and evil? It's prior to having knowledge of good and evil. That, he, he broke the commandment of God. He went and ate from that tree, knowing, he already knew, even though he did not have the knowledge of good and evil that we see here, he knew that it was wrong. Okay? Even Eve knew that it was wrong. You know, she, she, she goes back and forth with Satan and acknowledges that. And what I'm trying to say is, the commandment that God gave, they broke that commandment. That's why God is about to curse Adam, because he'd eaten from the tree. He says, I'm not cursing you because you have the knowledge of good and evil. He says, look, I'm cursing you because you've broken the commandment that I gave you. Okay, so let's keep going. Saying, uh, thou shalt not eat it, cursed. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So he's cursed because he's eaten from the tree, which he was commanded not to eat of, right? Now go to Genesis 3.22. Genesis 3.22. And this really just nails it down. It's not the knowledge of good and evil that damns someone, Okay. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. Okay, the Trinity right there, us. To know good and evil. All right, so who else knows good and evil? The Lord God. Okay, and here's where it falls. Because if you take the position, the knowledge of good and evil, when you have that knowledge, that's when you die spiritually. Well, guess who else has got knowledge of good and evil? The Lord God. Did he die spiritually? Of course not. This is kind of like the repentance fight. You know, you know, you know, the Bible says, uh, repent ye and believe the gospel. And we believe that. We believe that 100%, right? And so they say, see, you've got to repent of your sins in order to be saved. But hold on, how do we defeat that? Well, well there's many ways. But one way is, well, look, God repented more than any person in the Bible. So is the repentance, is someone that repents, does that mean they're a sinner and they need to turn from sin? No, because then we're saying God is the one that had to turn from sins himself. The same idea. Is it the knowledge of good and evil that causes someone to be lost? No, otherwise God is lost. Look, God has the knowledge of good and evil. So it's not the knowledge of good and evil that caused them to sin. They had sinned. They had broken the commandment prior to having the knowledge of good and evil. They ate from the tree. They got the knowledge of good and evil. Now they, oh, well, I'm naked. Wow, I'm naked. And uh, they clothe themselves. So, you know, it, that's, that's where the issue is. If, if you take the position you're lost because of knowledge of good and evil, that's where you go down the road of, taking the knowledge of good and evil, 20 years old, these kinds of things. So let's wrap it up. I hope that kind of answers a lot of questions. Let's wrap this up very quickly. What is the age of accountability according to Pastor Kevin Sepulveda? 20 years old, all right? I think you know, those that take the position of 20 years old as far as like for salvation have put together a pretty good argument. And I agree with a lot of those things. Again, I hear them. Yeah, I agree with all that. But it's not about salvation, okay? The age of accountability, 20 years old, is the age of adulthood. And God holds you greater accountable for the things you do wrong when you turn 20 years old, especially if you're a man. Especially if you're a man, now you need to give your half shekel. Hey, you ought to be out there working. And please go to Numbers chapter 1, verse 2, please. Numbers chapter 1, verse 2, just the last verse I'll get you to turn to. Numbers chapter 1, verse 2. While you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Ezra chapter 3, verse 8. Now, the book of Ezra is when they go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Ezra chapter 3, verse 8. Now, in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of uh, Josadak, and the remnant of their brethren. Look at this. The priests and the Levites, and all that were come out of captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites 
from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Boys, young boys, you know what God expects from you by the time you're 20 years old? That you're working a job. Okay, that's that because you're an adult. God says, look, you're old enough now to be doing something. You're old enough to be working there in the house of the Lord if you were the Levites in this time. You need to be out there working, building that second temple. Hey, you're old enough to give. You're half shekel. You should have been saving up by now. You should be out there, you know, being productive and not being lazy. Look, if you're 20 years old and you don't have a job, you're, you're, you're against the Lord God. You're, you're against, him, against his standard. Over the age of 20, as men, you ought to be out there working. You know, God's holding you accountable, fully accountable for your life. You can't hide behind mum and dad anymore, okay? And you guys are in Numbers chapter 1, verse 2. Numbers chapter 1, verse 2. Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number of the names, every male by their poles, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. What else do we see with the age of 20? That you have to be, as a man, you have to be over the age of 20 in order for you to be enlisted in the army and go fight a war. Okay, you're fully responsible, you're fully accountable, even for your own life, you know, to get out there and fight for the nation of Israel. So it's something very clear for us. We see that God sets the age of 20 as adulthood. And when you, when you become an adult, God says, look, you've got the knowledge of good and evil. You've got this greater knowledge than you had before. And this is why even in our, in our Western countries or our nations across the world set a certain age, right? They say, look, if, if a child does a crime, it's not that we let them go. It's just that we can't punish them as much. We've got to be a little bit more merciful with a child than an adult that does the same crime. Now, I don't know if that's right or wrong. I don't think that's right. You know, I think if you do the same crime as an adult, you probably deserve to be punished just like an adult. But, you know, our, 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 our societies do this. You know, for Australia, we set the age of 18. We say the age of 18 is the age of adulthood, you know. And uh, in some countries, America used to be 21. It's still 21 in some states, but some states have changed that to 18. Um, in Chile, I believe it might still be 21, but I think they're looking at changing that to the age of 18 when they say, hey, this is the age when you become an adult. We can now you know, try you, we can persecute you, uh, prosecute you as an adult that, rather than as a child. And there are still some countries that have the age of 20. That's Japan, New Zealand, Taiwan, and Thailand, where they said, hey, the age of 20 is the age of adulthood. So even our nations, our society recognize there's a, there's a period there, there's, there's an age within that 20 you know, group where you know, we recognize this is when someone now becomes an adult and they should be fully responsible for what they, what they do. And I'll just, I'll just end on this. You know, kids, God has a greater mercy upon you until you become an adult. You know? The things you do wrong, your dad should be correcting you. you know, your parents should be correcting you. you know, if your parents aren't pulling out the rod when you do wrong, you should go to your parents, mom and dad, can, we, can I be disciplined, like the Bible says? <laughs> can you get that rod and discipline me? Hey, why not? If you want to be in, in obedience with God, if, if, if your parents aren't doing it, go and ask them to do it for you. I mean, yeah, that's why not? If you're a godly child, you want to have that, yeah, you know? And, and man, if you're over the age of 20, you're not working, come on, you know? <laughs> you know, you, you're not serving your purpose that God has created for your life. You need to be out there, you know, earning that half shekel. You know, you, you need to be giving it to the house of God. We see that example there, you know, giving it so for the purpose of worship God in the house of God there in the tabernacle. And um, I just say this, if you're over the age of 20 and you're still messing around, you're over the age of 20, you're still committing sin, you can't hide behind mom and dad forever, okay? There comes a time when God says, you know what, no, I'm not going to be completely merciful on you now. I'm going to hold you completely accountable for what you've done. And you might be punished on this earth much harsher, you know, over the age of 20. You know, the chastisement will come upon you much harsher at the age of 20 than when it was when you were under 20. All right, so I do believe the age of accountability was 20 years old, but I don't believe it has anything to do with salvation. Let's pray.